And welcome to our community. Susie Thomas with you this morning. Always a pleasure to welcome Alexandra Nicholas Kuhn from the Maslin Museum. Good morning. Good morning. And there's always so much going on over there. How are you? How do you keep your head above water? <laughs> We have an amazing team and such a great community that supports us, and every day is different. Every week is different, so it's bustling with activity, but it's a great deal of fun, too. We should tell everyone where you're located, first of all. Sure. We're at 121 Lincoln Way East in Maslin, right in downtown, and we're winding down from a very large expansion project, so the construction fence is down. Hopefully, we're easier to find. But we're right in the heart of downtown, intersection of 1st Street East and Lincoln Way East. You made that so available to everyone throughout the in, in expansion, though, too. There was You never closed, did we you? We never closed. Nope. <laughs> so <laughs> we had excuse our dust, please, yes. signs up throughout <laughs> and maneuvering around construction and shifting between spaces was a challenge. But we've done it and we'll continue to do it for a while longer. But... As a tax-funded institution and really as the community's museum, we felt it was important we mm -hmm. remain open and visible. Best place to park is where? Well, there are two adjacent municipal lots that are free in which to park, and there's parking around the perimeter. It's just like navigating a downtown New York or anywhere else or maybe Cleveland mm -hmm. where you have to allow yourself perhaps a bit of extra time to park, but those lots um, just... A, behind and diagonally across from the museum are good places to look. And it's always an easy walk with sidewalks and everything. Absolutely. There will be a streetscape project mm. starting in Maslin in the next month or so, which may prove a bit challenging, but we'll have information on our website about how to navigate. And it might be a little challenging in the interim, but the outcome will be incredible. It'll yes. be a beautiful new aesthetic and easier navigation between downtown businesses. And it's so exciting to see everything going on at Maslin. You said the word free a minute ago there. Mm -hmm. Admission to the Maslin Museum is what? Free. That's amazing. It has been for 86 years. How do you do that? Well, the citizens of Maslin are who enable us to maintain that free admission price mm -hmm. by way of their support through a property tax levy. And it's been always an important aspect of the museum to be as accessible as possible. So even our location in downtown. Parking might be a bit challenging at times, as we discussed, but it's visible, it's accessible, very closely located to numerous bus stops. Mm -hmm. So that's important to us. It's unique in that it's a historical museum, but it's an art museum at the same time. Correct. Tell me a little bit about how you merge those two things. Sure. So we always strive to balance those two facets of our mission as an art museum and a history museum. We are unique in that way. We have everything from, you know, hundreds of pairs of salt and pepper shakers. We may have talked about that previously <laughs> to farm equipment, to steam engines, an automobile. And then we have this really fabulous collection of historical garments and sculptures and paintings. Mm -hmm. Photographs are very heavily represented in our collection with over 70,000. So I think that affords us the opportunity to be so versatile in the topics we approach. There's not really a topic, whether it be rooted in art or history, we cannot connect to by way of our right. collections or the community's rich history. Before we get into what some of these programs are going to be, do you ever get to go just root around in like, I don't know, is it a is an attic? Is it a basement? Wherever the storage area happens to be and just have so much fun, be like exploring? Yeah, so it used to resemble an attic a lot more before it. we endeavored to renovate and bring our collection storage up to state-of-the-art mm -hmm. and um, capacity in 2010. So it very much used to feel like we were exploring all the time. And there weren't even lights there was no heat. There were holes in the ceiling and floor. So it really felt oh. like you were <laughs> <laughs> up in the um, attic. <laughs> up in the attic. That's not yeah. to say we didn't also maintain the best possible care we could within mm -hmm. those circumstances. But after having renovated, it's a professional storage space. And when I was the curator from 2004 to 2011, I did have the opportunity to, you know, quote unquote, rummage around yeah. more freely. But now I don't have as much time for that. Right. But the staff and the interns and the volunteers 
who do assume that responsibility are always so excited to show us new discoveries. And they are being made all the time because we have over 100,000 artifacts. Oh, that's amazing. In your permanent collection. Mm -hmm. Oh, that would just be like a, look what I just found. There are incredible, incredible items, some dating to the ancient Mm. American Indians. Mm. Um, we have Renaissance era work represented. We have some artifacts from ancient Egypt and Rome. And then we have a lot of artifacts that represent the past 100 years of regional history. Sure. The so, kinds of things that even as Americans we consider old. Absolutely. Like we think, oh, a Civil War thing. That's so cool. Right. But you're talking about more like going over to Europe and seeing things that are true antiquities. Absolutely. We do have, because of the industrial wealth that was present in Maslin at the turn of the century, the turn of the... Mm -hmm. The other century. The other, right. Yeah. The 19th <laughs> century. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of travel back and forth to Europe and other parts of the world. And artifacts were brought back or there were um, there was a capacity for a lot of the the wealthy residents to purchase artwork from dealers mm -hmm. and our um, collections reflect that oh my goodness it's just exciting when you say mm -hmm. professional storage space real quickly what does that describe it what is involved with that sure Keeping so everything it's, nice it's environmentally controlled, so there's very controlled temperature and humidification being introduced into the space to keep a consistent mm. temperature that a majority of objects like or are comfortable in, if you will. And there are museum-quality cabinets that are special powder-coated steel, and they're, the doors are all double-gasketed to keep from wow. you know, certain things that things off-gas over the years to keep those from permeating other things and... They're all they're separated by type, and it's still packed to the brim, but <laughs> in a way that's much more organized yeah. than than before. So it takes a lot of time and money to maintain collections in a way that will ensure their mm -hmm. preservation for as long a period of for as possible generations mm -hmm. to come. And I love that the citizens of Maslin consider that important enough that they keep voting it in for property type pay. Yes, take some of this. We want to keep this going. It's remarkable. Of course, that requires that we continue to assure them and retain their faith in our ability to do that well. And so that is part of why we are so busy, active, invisible, because we want the community to know that we're hard at work, mm -hmm. ensuring that those stories stay alive and that we have lots of also fun and entertaining and engaging programs that are relevant to present day for them to partake in. Well, let's talk about what some of those are. You've got sure. a bunch coming up. Um, first of all, the big read. What is that? Yeah, so we are fortunate to have received for the past 12 years funding from the National Endowment for the Arts to facilitate what's called the big read. And I believe there are only two communities in Ohio this year that have been selected. Typically, there are about 75 to 80 nationwide who are selected. So we work in tandem with our Maslin Public Library to launch about 30 to 40 programs for the community, all of which focus on a book. And this year's book selection is a collection of short stories about Appalachia called Burning Bright mm -hmm. by Ron Rash. And we're so thrilled that Ron Rash is he's a living author, so he'll be delivering a keynote address in April. Mm. Okay. But what date is that? It is April, I believe it is April 24th, but let's okay. check that. Double check it. Um, because I have a calendar with numerous things in front of me. Um, it is Thursday, I'm sorry, April 25th. Okay. And, that and that's when the actual author will be in town. That's when the author will be in town. But mm -hmm. the Big Read kicks off on Saturday, March 23rd. Mm. So just a few days away. And between 3 and 5 on that date at the museum, anyone can come in and pick up a free copy of the book. Mm -hmm. So that's what this grant helps facilitate, distribution of free copies of the book, as well as a, a wide array of programs that help appreciate and uh, help converse on the topics addressed within the book. I think people would be surprised to know, if they've not been there, uh, what kind of other world there is this close to us right. when you travel through Appalachia. Um, had an opportunity to be a camp counselor there for a week, and I felt like I was living the book Christie. If you've ever read the book Christie, I felt like Christie. 
where it was an entirely different way of life. At that time, now this is years ago, this might be different by now, but at that time, they didn't have house addresses. When the little girls were checking in, we'd say, and where do you live? And it would be like, over down there, over the, the river there. You know, and it w- that's how they explained where their homes were. They didn't have street addresses at the part where we were having this camp. So it was like, honestly, like going back in time. What kinds of things will we see when we get to see the exhibit? Sure. Well, I'm glad that you provided that anecdote because part of what the book and the corresponding exhibition in the main gallery that also opens on March 23rd are aimed to do is um, present a more diverse range of perspective into what comprises Appalachia Mm -hmm. because there are certainly parts – and, and Appalachia is a huge region. In fact, we have this map that we have um, included in the exhibition gallery to show the parts that touch Ohio, mm-hmm. New York, Kentucky, Tennessee, um, you know, Pennsylvania. Yes. It, there are huge and many more states that I haven't named. Um, it's really quite a, a, a large terrain. Um, but there are parts that are quite rural and sort of untouched by a lot of what we would that's what this think was. of as being you know old commonplace um in the makeup of our communities and then there are you know other parts that you wouldn't differentiate mm-hmm. from More industrial and... visibly right so mm-hmm. um so there's an exhibition called looking at appalachia in the main gallery that's curated by um um a gentleman who is from appalachia and is a photographer himself and he's curated this photography exhibit of photo submissions from people who reside in Appalachia from their eyes, from their perspective, Mm. the communities in which they have been brought up or currently live. And so it really is an awesome way to illustrate the the region and hope and you know dispel some myths and maybe confirm others, um, but really engage in dialogue. And then we have a complimentary exhibition to that in our Fred F. Silk Room Gallery called Looking at Maslin. Mm. And we've asked individuals to do the same, to oh, interesting. share with us photos that they have taken in Maslin over the past year, had to only be a year um, old, to sort of capture what the community thinks of as its Maslin through their lenses, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. whether it be their camera, their actual camera, their iPhone camera, or what have you. But um, it's going to, I think, create a platform for really starting to open up about in conversation about this particular region. Mm-hmm. Well, I think no matter where you go in Appalachia, it is beautiful. Mm-hmm. There are going to be some stunning photographs I'm sure just taking a look through the years the mountains the Mm -hmm. absolutely beautiful terrain absolutely so much of it you know there are a lot of special grant programs specific to that region for individuals and for the arts communities there that have been affected by um, affected economically you know adversely over the years so there are a lot of programs that help jumpstart efforts in those Mm -hmm. areas to continue to encourage people to populate and um, you know, establish businesses in those areas and continue to allow the arts to thrive. But there are so many artistic traditions also that originated from this area that um, we'll be touching upon as well throughout the course of the next seven weeks. So, oh, man, when I think excited. of the artisans that have come from there and mm-hmm. the, some even lost arts of, of beautiful crafts. And, Absolutely. Yeah, it, that will be really, really great. Yes. All right. And tell us when that is going to be again. So March 23rd, mm-hmm. 3 to 5 p.m., free at the museum. We'll also have refreshments during that time. We'll debut all those exhibitions I spoke of. You can retrieve your free copy of Burning Bright. And then inside, although this information is on our website too, org, but inside each book will be a bookmark front and back just full of dates for events that the community can participate in. And they range from book discussions to the keynote on April 25th, film screenings, Mm. um, art activities, and lots of other programs. Great. Well, you've been a busy bee. (laughs) Yes. For sure. We have. We do need to take a short little break. We'll be back with Alex Kuhn after these words. You're listening to Our Community.